Welcome to Out of the Box with Christine, the podcast for conscious entrepreneurs. Are you willing to step into your greatness? Are you ready to shine? Well, get ready, truth seeker. You're in for an amazing ride. And now, here's the host of the show, Christine Blasdale. Welcome back to Out of the Box with Christine online, on air, and on demand. I'm your host, Christine Blasdale. And today, buckle up your seatbelts, people, because we are going to have an adventure, an adventure into life. And with my very special guest, I'm super honored to have on. John Strelecki is the number one best selling inspirational author of The Cafe on the Edge of the World a story about the meaning of life, and many other books. His works actually have been translated into 43 languages and sold more than 7 million copies worldwide. He has been honored alongside Oprah Winfrey, Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra, as one of the 100 most inspirational thought leaders in the field of leadership and personal development. I couldn't think of a better person to have on Out of the Box with Christine. So welcome, John, to the program. Thank you. So great to be here. So great to see you. Yeah, you was you keeping some good company, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a good adventure, a good ride, that's for sure. Did you ever think, you know, 10, 15 years ago that you would be one of the most inspirational thought leaders? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, take me back even farther than I think I'd even do anything. I thought no, but uh, no, I, I left it all behind in my early 30s to go backpack around the world simply because I was looking at my life and thinking, if I keep doing what I'm doing in 10 years, where will I be and would I be okay with that? And the answer was no. And ever since I was a little kid, I had dreamed of seeing the world and seeing Africa and so left it all behind to go backpack around the world. Everyone said I was nuts. So no, when I did that, I just thought, well, I'm going to go seek freedom and adventure and whatever happens, happens. So backpack, first of all, it's one thing to be jet setting around the world, <laughs> staying, at, <laughs> staying at a five-star hotel. We just had, we just stayed at a hotel in the city uh, this weekend and it was quite wonderful. And yet you backpack. Now, was this with just yourself or with your family? Uh, at the time, it was myself and my just had been married wife. So uh, I always shared to everyone, if you're looking for a little test to see if the relationship's going to hold up, why don't you go backpack around the world for a year and that'll really test you. Yeah. Sleeping in tents, sleeping in super low down, run down places. Oh, that's, that, yeah, that's, that, that sounds um, adventuresome. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, it was awesome for me, but you know, for example, I remember, I think it took us 38 hours to go from our starting point, which was in Florida, to arrive in Bangkok, Thailand, by the time we connected to all the flights, all the different things. And so 38 hours, we get there, we find a backpacker place on the street called Koh San Road, which is like the, the leaping off point for backpackers. Well, this was my first great year-long adventure kind of thing. And so we got there, we found a place, dumped our bags in the room and walk out. And I just remember walking on Koh San Road and looking at all these other people, travelers from all over the world, all with stories, all ready for adventure. And I just felt so alive. Like I just couldn't even imagine. You felt at home, didn't you? Yeah, totally. Isn't that bizarre? Halfway around the world in a country that I don't speak the language, don't know the culture, I felt at home. I, got, I just got goosebumps. That's my little goosebump meter. That's Christine's like meter of, um, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, isn't it interesting? And, and, you know, not being at the five-star hotel and seeing all the ritzy people, but actually seeing life and, and, and people in different situations. Um, and as we know, there's, you know, people say, oh, people from third world countries, they're so, they're poor, they're unhappy, they're miserable. And the studies have shown that a lot of times people who have less are actually more happy than us who have cell phones, tablets, you know, all, all the crazy stuff. Did you? Did it's you amazing. That? Yeah. It was amazing to me to, so I came from the world of high stress, high power consulting. And so I would get called on a Thursday and they would say, we need you to come in on Monday morning and be an expert on corrugated boxes or on farm equipment or whatever. And so then my job was to come in on Monday morning and have a really good story to tell to a board of directors about what they could do for their organization. So super high stress. And, you know, I remember distinctly that 
there was one big brouhaha when the presentation had been stapled in the wrong corner of the presentation. Like people were flipping out about this. And uh, so then, you know, yeah, you go out on the, on the road and you see little kids who are six, seven years old who are out there with a knife cutting pineapples and selling it by the spears to make money for themselves or for their families. And you see people who have nothing. And there was one moment in particular, I remember as you're describing this. So we got to Thailand and we took a long bus trip and got to this place on the ocean. And there was a dude there renting A-frames with no sides, just the A-frames and sort of nothing in the middle, just a mattress. And uh, so we rented that place. It was like, I don't know, $3 or something for the night. I wake up the next morning and this guy's got like nothing, Christine. Like, I mean, he's got his little A-frames that he's renting out, but he doesn't have a big house and whatever. So I climb down the steps from my A-frame and I'm just kind of like surveying life. I've only been in the country 48 hours or so. And he's picking fruit from the trees and he sees me and he waves me over and he just hands me a whole bunch of the fruit that he's picking. And I just couldn't help but think in that moment, like in my own country, in my own world that I had just left hours before in the business world, like nobody would have given you anything for free. Like this guy had nothing and what he had, he was willing to give. I, I was just blown away. And yeah, it's amazing how people can be incredibly happy, um, incredibly loving and caring, even though they don't have anywhere near the material possessions that we seem to possess. Maybe it's because of that. It's also the yeah. appreciation of, sim of, of simple things. I, I know, yeah. you know, I've been to some countries too where um, just gathering fresh drinking water, you know, you have a glass of water. Yeah. We take it for granted, oh, yeah. you know, that we, that we have access to that. But in many places, yeah. that's that's a luxury to have, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. In much of Sub-Saharan Africa, totally. Yeah, you walk for hours to get yourself some drinking water that you have to boil then so that you can drink it. You know, it's amazing. Wow. Oh my! I goodness. think what it taught me too is, is how much of life is a choice. And so, in that situation, yeah, I, I met people who were unhappy and miserable too. So it's not like everybody was super happy in those scenarios. But it was very apparent to me that you're while you may not be able to control all the elements of your life. You can definitely be the one who controls how you react to those elements and how you feel and how you interact with others. It's a choice. That's, that's the key. That seems to be the key to life, yeah. right? Because you can look at things, you know, you can look at a, a relationship breakup as the worst thing in the world, go into a spiral of depression and um, be angry and all that stuff. Or it could be, you could look at it and go, maybe god or the universe just helped me dodge a bullet <laughs> and uh, yeah. pushed them out of the way for something greater for someone greater to come so it is so much of how we look at things so isn't it yeah and sometimes you get these like major aha moments that help you process things like that so when you're describing uh what you just described you're talking about how something could make someone angry i remember i had a, an unbelievably profound moment my daughter was only about two she was in the back of my truck and I was driving and somebody cut me off on the road. So like, you know, almost hits you where they're like super tight to you on, on the cutoff. And I was just livid. I felt the anger boiling inside of me. And it's, it kind of takes a lot to get me riled up. I'm a pretty laid back guy. But so I felt my anger boiling and the dude was just flying down the road, you know. And I remember in that moment thinking to myself, why am I so unbelievably angry? And I had this tremendous aha epiphany. And I realized at that moment that anger is a manifestation of fear. And I thought to myself, wait, what am I afraid of right now? And I realized, wait, that idiot doesn't realize that the person I love more than anything in the world is in the back seat. That's my little baby. That's my girl back there. And his stupidity, his arrogance at cutting me off like that could have led to her getting injured or even worse. How does he not realize that? Well, of course, Christine, by the time all this is going in my head, he's four miles down the road right yeah. <laughs> It's like the moment is long gone. But it was a powerful life epiphany because I realized from that point on that anger is a manifestation of fear. And if I'm really willing to be bold in those moments of my anger, I can ask myself, what am I afraid of? And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. Sometimes I just want to be angry. <laughs> but it is tremendously eye-opening when we can allow ourselves to use these types of tools to live the life that we want to live instead of just being controlled by the emotions. Well, it's, it's being conscious. It's being conscious yeah. of, of our of our actions and our, and our reactions. And I think it's okay. You know, it's also okay to have those moments where you, you have that pity party, you know, you, you, yeah. you, or you have that, that, that moment where you, you might unleash a bit of anger to the world or to a particular person who can't hear you anyway, because they're in a car yeah. driving 8,000 <laughs> miles an hour. 
Um, <laughs> I used to say that. Was, I used to say that. I forget who I was with. I was with someone who, oh my gosh, they would get really angry at drivers. You know, <laughs> you know, all these expletives in the car, and um, and and angry. And I said, you know what? They can't hear you. I can hear you. And yeah. <laughs> really obnoxious, but they can't hear you. Right. They yeah. Can't, they exactly. Don't, they don't hear what you're saying. But um, record but yeah, it, and we'll try and get their phone number. We'll text it to them later. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Now, in your in your book, uh, the best selling book, "The Cafe on the Edge of the World," um, you ask some. There's some questions, and and yeah. these are, I think, I think these are the big ones, right, in our life. You know, before, before that magic curtain draws at the end of our lives. Um, these are some of the more important questions, and these are questions that you've asked yourself as well. Um, let's talk about these. The, the 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 first one is, and this is I think something that trips a lot of people up uh, and frustrates people because they don't know what the answer is and they want to have the answer because we like to have it in a box. Um, the first one is, why are you here? Right? Yeah. Talk about yeah, that. such a great question. Uh, something that I. I remember thinking about when I was younger and it was in the context of trying to figure out life, even as a, a young kid, I just couldn't figure out what seemed to be insanity to me. Most people would go to school forever and then they eventually would get a job that they didn't like. And then they would do that forever. And then finally at age 65, they would retire. And even as a kid, I just looked at that and thought, seriously, <laughs> that's it. Like, that's what we're here for. And then as I grew older and was more entering into the world of that, uh, I, especially I started working when I was about 12 years old to try and make money. And I remember asking that question of myself, like, why am I here? Like, what is the point of this game of life? And it took me a long time to, to kind of figure that out. And one of the big things I've realized over the years, as I do book signings and the rest of that is when I was younger, I thought I was the only one asking these questions. I thought I was the only one struggling with this. And one of the most humbling and wonderful things that I get from readers is when they say, you help me realize that I'm not alone. Because they also thought they were the only one wondering about these things. And we're not. It's just, it's not a typical part of the conversation, although it's becoming more so, I think, which is wonderful. Well, and and I I tend to also think, you know, that that question of, you know, why am I here? Um, I I kind of think like, you know what, maybe I don't, I don't need to necessarily know everything. Like I don't need to know all the people that I, I touch. Um, but I do know that I'm able to influence and, and impact people um, simply by the way that I behave in the world and that ripple effect. And oh, even, yeah. even like I was saying online, you know, on air and on demand, this program is aired um, with beautiful guests as such as yourself is aired, of course, on all the podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, all that great stuff. It's also on YouTube so that people who are visual can get this message and share it. It's yeah. easy to share a YouTube video. But now it's also um, on radio. And so people who are driving in their cars who are asking these very same questions, <laughs> right? And what I, what I find is that when you're doing the work that you're passionate about, and John, you're, you're passionate about what you do helping others and traveling and experiencing life, but sharing those journeys with others to inspire them and, and maybe motivate them. Um, same here. When I'm doing something that I'm passionate about, I don't have to worry about who is going to be impacted by it because the person who's supposed to hear the show, hear my guests or see us um, will see us or will yeah. hear us. And there'll be people that I'll never, ever meet. And it's probably the yeah. same with you. People who are going to pick up your book, who are going to be so moved or listen to you, and you'll never meet them, but you've impacted their life in some way. And that is a life lived. I mean, I, I, totally. I think that is something that's so important to think about as well. Yeah, totally. It's very easy in the world in which we live in. We were talking about LA before, and uh, it's very easy to get caught up in the numbers. And so, oh, well, how many thousands of followers, millions of followers, millions of books. And, and it's very easy to get caught up in that. At the end of the day, in the eyes of the universe, I think if you help one person, it's the same as helping a million. And people often ask me, having read the books and they feel called to make a difference, and they say, well, what do you recommend? And I actually recommend almost the same exact thing that you said. I just said, be authentic. You know, if, if you allow yourself to be authentic 
then whatever it is, whatever that means for you, whether you're an adventure traveler, whether you're a radio host, a podcast host, a, a great parent, a teacher, a farmer, whatever, whatever you are, but when you are your most authentic. So what I've learned is that's really the key. You know, if you allow yourself to be authentic, that other people will see you and you may not even know that they see you, but by you being authentic, you enable them to be and inspire them to be authentic also. And that's really how we change the world. Yeah. And I'm going to quote you on here too. We're going to come, I want, so I want to come back to those questions because one of them I love. I'm Scorpio. So anything around death, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> the, you have, there's a quote. I love this too. Uh, you say, and this, I believe so much. Um, the more we believe in our own self-worth, the more we inspire others to believe in theirs, that's how we change the world. Yeah, yeah. Self-worth. This is something that it trips up a lot of people. And oh, yeah. especially, especially young people. Um, I find that, uh, and, you know, we, teenagers today, the kids have gone through so much with COVID and stress and political and violence. Schools, hey. They got to worry about sometimes going to school, um, bullies, you know, all of that. And with social tech, you know, with these things, a bully is, yeah. you know, it's a different thing. Than Everywhere. Thing. 24 by 7. Yep. Yeah. So um, can you talk about that quote? Because I love that. Yeah. It's really something that hit me because I, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence when I was younger. I definitely didn't have a sense of who I was. I didn't feel I would make any contributions to the world, let alone survive my own existence. And so there came a moment when I realized that when we feel so bad about ourselves and we're so lost in our own place, that it's very typical and common then to judge other people. And it's, it's entirely based on our own insecurities. Uh, but when we see them doing something well, we make up a story to justify why they have it so much easier than us, or we have it so much harder than them or whatever. I'm sure I did it a thousand different ways when I was struggling with this. And what I eventually realized, which is what's in that quote, is that when I start to embrace whatever is the genius within me, and we all have genius within us, whenever, when I start to embrace the genius that is within me and to accept me for who I am in my most authentic self, it's amazing how when I look at that other person, I see them for their most authentic self. And instead of criticizing it or judging it, I embrace it because I've learned to embrace that part of humanity. So it was life changing for me when I came to that. Yeah. Well, and also um, it helps that you've also you've traveled so much too, and you've seen people from all all different uh, spectrums. Now, another big question um, that you that you speak about in the cafe on the edge of the world is: Do you fear death? Yeah. And um, I'd love to have your uh, to get your spin on on death, <laughs> um, because I myself have had a near death experience and I've ex um, experienced my own little close call, um, and I just want to know what what your um, thoughts are on this topic. Well, I'll give you my two cents for it, and then I'd love to hear your story about it and what you feel the way ways in which you feel it impacted you and continues to impact you. Um, in the context of the story in the cafe world. What John learns when he's there is that people don't fear dying. What they fear is getting to the end of their life and realizing that they haven't really lived. And, you know, there's really nothing more tragic, I think, than getting to the end and looking back and saying, wow, I really wish I would have. You know, I, I knew that I could have. I had it in me, but I just didn't. And I think that would be really tragic. So that to me is, is the really great fear associated with death. Um, I've had two close calls myself. And uh, the last one was about one one hundredth of a second away from ending my time on the planet. And uh, so, yeah, they shake you up a bit and they help you remember just how precious this gift is for sure. So I'd, I'd love to hear about yours and what your takeaways were and how it impacts you. Yeah, you know what? Actually, um, it was very interesting because I was in Costa Rica at the time and um, it was almost as if I was... Mm, given the opportunity to say, by the way, you're going to die now. <laughs> wow. um, and, you know, are you okay with this? Uh, and what it is, is that time for, for me at that moment, and I'm sure other people have different experiences, but for me, 
time slowed down, like something that was probably, you know, a couple seconds, um, literally just slowed way down and in, in wow. slow-mo to the point of, cause I was, I was, um, in the, in the ocean and I was, um, boogie boarding for like the first time. And there was a massive swell, massive, uh, set of waves coming in. And, um, my boogie board, I just remember, I remember this so vividly of the board being picked up and I'm sort of uh, underneath the, the wave as it's lifting up and I'm looking up at the board and I could just see drops of water just come off the board and just drop, just drip right onto my forehead, like, bloop. and I looked back and I saw um, there was a big rock that was exposed once the water got sucked in, right? So you just see the, this big, massive flat rock. And then there was a bunch of uh, like cliffs behind it, like jagged rocks. It was not good. You know, it was, no, I was like, that's, not, okay. that's not what you want to see when you're looking down. Yeah. I'm going to break my neck or uh, my back. Uh, I'm going to hit my head against the rocks and I'm going to die uh, because there was also, it was more waves coming after that. And so I just, I said, oh, okay, this is the end. And I got a real quick, you know, I got, I got a real quick, uh, like a carousel of my life and moments that, you know, things that you, here's the thing, the things that you think in life are so important are not the things that flash through your, when you're in those final moments, there are little things, there, there are little moments, there are little things that you would, you know, you wouldn't think were big, but they are important in your life. So those things kind of flashed by, and then I got to see um, my mom react to my uh, death. Uh, I got to, she actually, in this scenario, um, witnessed it as a on a, the news. So she didn't oh, even wow. hear from anybody. She saw it in the news that this you know American, stupid American, <laughs> who couldn't, who should not be in a big wave thing like that. Um, and so I said, I said, oh, oh, no, 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 that no. Um, and the voice or the thing said, you know, are you sure you, you sure you don't want to, you know, I was like, no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't think that would be good for her. But at the moment when I was given the option, when I was asked, are you ready? I looked around and I was connected to everything, John. Wow. In that moment, you know how they say, and it, it sounds like a bumper sticker you know, we're all one, you, you know, one world, you know, what we're all one, one, you know, one universe, all that stuff. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Cause you don't feel like that. But at that moment I was connected to everything. And I mean, everything, the birds, the water, the rock, the, the universe, people that I couldn't even see, but I felt that I was connected with them and it was the most beautiful feeling. So I was ready. I was actually, you know what? This is paradise. I feel really great. Sure. And then I got, I got to see what would happen as a result of, of my death. Amazing. And I was like, <laughs> my mom can't handle that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and then magically, you know, the, the law of physics and everything just go out the window when you have those moments. I've heard of people in, in near car, you know, near death experiences in cars where they should have been dead. Right. And, Somebody, you know, somebody comes and plucks them out at the last minute and then, you know, they're gone, you know, the, like the angel thing. Whoop. Um, and that's how it was for me. I was I was upside down on a giant wave and it was like somebody had picked up a cat from the back of the neck and <laughs> put me on the, you know, on the top and said, OK, you you've you've chosen. Now you've got to fight for it. And man, I my board was being sucked in by the water and I was just like, I want to live. I want to live. And so it was just a moment where also when you have a near death experience, it changes you. It, yeah. it changes you. Um, I'm not afraid of dying because it's the most beautiful experience. Um, it's, it's, Wait, it's, if you don't mind my asking, where were you at in your life up to that point? Like, were you at a major decision point? Were you happy? Were you depressed? Were you like, why do you think that I was experience 20, happened? I was 21 i was you know okay. th thought i knew everything <laughs> <laughs> thought that i could surf a big wave you know why not um yeah no you know it was just it was a moment that um it changed me it was like you know before the like, bc before christ you know, right before yeah. before the new BW, before the wave and after the wave yeah and 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 after yeah and it was just like i said um so beautiful 
uh, but that also our life impacts other people and our and our passing does as well Mm -hmm. and we we you know that's part of it i think a lot of times we people stick around because the people that love us will be you know they don't want to see them in pain yeah right yeah so what a crazy amazing gift at 21 though to have that perspective and you get to carry that with you forever like that's very i would imagine that's incredibly comforting to to be able to carry that energy of connectedness Oh, it, absolutely. And I've, uh, the other near death experiences or not, it's not even near death experiences, just other experiences where um, something really bad could have happened. Um, I don't I don't know if you've had this on your travels uh, at all, but um, sometimes they'll have that voice. Uh, it'll yeah. be oh, yeah. some voice and they'll go, you try to go through an intersection in your car. And I heard that voice when I was in college. I remember it was like in my right ear and it was um, stop. And I was like, I looked left, I looked right, I didn't see any cars. I was like, what are you talking about? And it was like, stop. And I was, so I stopped and a car flew through the intersection. Like, it was like a spaceship. I don't know how, where it came from. Um, but if I had gone, I would have, I would have definitely been T-boned. And, yeah. But it's that voice that comes in, in these really just opportune moments in life. Have you had that experience as well? I've had some really interesting ones in that regard. I'll, I'll tell you one about gratitude that I had like that. I was uh, driving in my car. I'd had a tough day. Well, tough day in quotes. Um, I was working on some contract. It didn't come through. Somebody didn't do their part of a, of a job that was supposed to be done. And I was frustrated and angry. And I'm um, driving my car and I'm pulling up to the entrance ramp to the highway close to where I live. And I'm in the midst of my personal pity party and frustrated and the rest of that. And I see a guy walking down the entrance ramp to the highway. Now, where I live, there's really nowhere that you could come from to be walking that way. I mean, you literally would be walking on the highway for miles to get up to that point to walk down it. And I remember looking at him and thinking, that's so bizarre. And then I looked closer as he got closer to me, and he had one arm, only one arm. And there are so many things, Christine, that I do in my life, from picking up my my little girl back when she was a baby, to surfing, to playing beach volleyball, all these things that I love that I hold so near and dear. That would be so much more difficult for me if I only had one arm, let alone was one armed and walking down a highway entrance ramp going the wrong way. And just in that moment, it hit me. I felt so humbled and so foolish and so, you know, ungrateful for everything that I have. And then traffic started to move. And as I started to move with the traffic, I looked in my rearview mirror to see him and he wasn't there. And there was nowhere else for him to go. And there was not nearly enough time for him to have gotten down to the end of the entrance ramp. And I think about that all the time. And I think it's the same thing you're talking about. I, I've come to believe, and while I can't explain exactly how it works, I have come to believe that there are angels out there or entities out there or energies out there, whether we're manifesting it in our mind and then seeing it as if it's real or whether it really is another conscious entity that is helping guide us in those moments that we are most sort of ready to be guided, or in my case, most in need of a little wake up call. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. And it's one of those life mysteries too, that are just makes makes life a little, you know, like a little juicy novel as well. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Totally. But what's fascinating for me is I noticed that um, I see, so when I'm having a personal pity party day, uh, I I will almost always see like a child in a wheelchair or something and instantly it brings me back. And what, what I'm embarrassed about in those moments is like, what if that life form, what if that entity exists in that moment, all those years, like say it's an eight-year-old kid and they existed all those years in that eight-year-old body for that moment to remind me of how lucky I am and how grateful I am. Like that is a, an angel that is like to have gone through that sacrifice for me to remember. That's unbelievable. And uh, so, yeah, it's incredibly humbling. And it, I, I try and take those moments to heart and be as grateful as possible and helpful. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, my gosh. You're a beautiful human being. Um, <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about um, uh, something here, too, that you say, which I think is really um, in a love. I love this. Uh, tapping into the cosmic algorithm of the universe. Algorithms. Yeah. I'm I'm very aware of algorithms because I'm on TikTok and Instagram, and I'm trying to right. understand the algorithm of social media. <laughs> but um, the cosmic algorithm of the universe. Uh, talk about that if you don't mind. It ties into what we've been discussing, actually, in that there, as I've been on the planet for as many decades as I have, and I'm curious beyond words about 
why are we here? How does this whole game work? What is the point of all this? What's underlying all of it? I'm firmly convinced that there is far more to the experience than what we can see. And I'll give you an example of it as it relates to the cosmic algorithm. Many, many times in my life, when uh, especially when I was less aware because I had less time on the planet or hadn't thought of it, I remember thinking to myself, I wish my life was different. And I would think about how different I wanted it to be. But in truth, my actions were just doing the same thing today that I had done yesterday. And what I realized at one point is that the algorithm of the universe, the cosmic algorithm of the universe, is very similar to some of the algorithms that we are familiar with. And that if I get on Google and I type in purple cows with pink polka dots, and I do that 50 times in a row, at some point very near after that or in the process of that, I'm going to start to get articles and videos and pictures and advertisements for purple cows with pink polka dots because the algorithm is looking at my behavior and saying well this is what he or she is interested in and therefore i'll give them more of that on a cosmic level the way this seems to work is that if i sit in my chair in my office uh, and i'm working at this job that i don't like and i'm doing that for 10 or 12 hours a day that the algorithm is looking and saying well this is really fascinating so he loves being a dad and his daughter has a, a football game today, a soccer game today, but he's not there. And he likes to feel physically fit and feel well, but wow, his back is really hurting as he sits in that chair, but he still keeps doing it. You know, he still keeps doing it. And he wants to be an adventurer. He wants to travel the world, but man, 10 to 12 hours a day, he sits in that chair and looks at that screen. Well, he, he is a creature of free will. He could do whatever he wants. And I, as the entity, am a benevolent force. So since he could do whatever he wants, he must love that. And therefore, I will give him more of that. And this is the way the algorithm seems to work, that our actions are demonstrating to the cosmic what it is that is of interest to her. So if we want something different in our life, one of the key and most critical steps is to demonstrate that by taking action. And the minute we do that, it seems to reset the algorithm. And the more we actively add on to that, it's sort of like the 50 purple cows with pink polka dots. And so if I say I want to be an adventure traveler and go see the Great Barrier Reef, the more time I'm actively working towards that in my actions, certainly in my, my thoughts too, but especially in my actions, the algorithm seems to activate to support that. And that's when you have the crazy random coincidental conversation with a person in the coffee shop who sees you looking at a picture of a book and is like, hey, you going to Australia? You're going to drive the Great Barrier Reef? Like, I got family who lives. I mean, these are the moments that only seem to happen when you're tapping into the algorithm in the right way. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is I mean, like, in your life, like you told me offline about you going to Australia. Like it's like the perfect algorithm. No, but what what I equate it to like um to like the universe, God, love, whatever you want to call it, is like being a waitress, like you're at a cafe or you're at a diner and the waitress is sitting there going, What do you want? You know, like okay, what do you want? And, and you and you're looking I'll bring at you whatever menu. you want. You gotta tell me. And you're looking at the menu and you're like, oh, I you know, I hate cheeseburgers, I hate this, I hate that, da, da, da. and the waitress is that it's like, okay, what 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 you know, what is it that you want? They're they're ready to take your order. And <laughs> and we don't realize how golden that opportunity is because a lot yeah. of times we see the negative, right? We we speak it out as well. And especially, and you know, and 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 men have probably have a different voice that they or that repeated mantra that they have. But a lot of women, you know, it's like, I'm 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 old, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm this, I'm that, and that is being sent out into the universe repeatedly. And yeah. it's like, you you got to be a little bit cautious of what you put out in the universe because it does come back. And be specific too. That's the other thing. Yeah. Be specific, because yeah. I, 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 I said I want the perfect person in my life, and I, they're going to be funny, and they're going to be beautiful, and they're going to, and you know, my wife now, my wife popped up in my life, but I didn't realize she was be seven thousand miles away. So that was a, <laughs> that was a bit of a journey, but I'm, you know, I'm just glad that I'm glad that the waitress of life listened to me. <laughs> I love that analogy, and you know, one of the reasons I love that is well, obviously, because I wrote a book called The Cafe on the Edge of the World, and <laughs> the most important character is the waitress in that book, and. So I love it from that perspective too, but I also love it from what you're just saying. There's that moment where you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. The waitress would be like, I'll give you a few minutes. You let me know when you're ready. And so that's sort of the way the algorithm is working too, that if I'm just circling around, bouncing back uncertain, the algorithm doesn't know what to do for me. And so it just sort of says, well, 
you let me know when you're ready. And then the minute you say you're ready and you draw the line in the sands and you start taking action in that regard, it's like all the uncertainty becomes propellant to move you in the direction that you want to go. And you said the key thing, action. Yeah. It's not just enough to have a vision board. You know, it's not just enough no. to say, oh, I really want to. I, and I, I've learned the lesson too about wanting. The, the thing of wanting something that, that creates more wanting because it's, it's an action verb. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's something that instead of that, I, I tend to try and um, imagine as if it's already happened. And yeah. I'm grateful for the thing that's already happened, if that makes sense. It's a little mind, yeah, well, a little mind trick, but um, I find that you it, mentioned, it works a miracle. There's a lot of what a, great things that happen from that. Yeah, totally. You had mentioned the word mantra a couple seconds ago. And so I will give everyone who's listening a tip that I've discovered about using these moments of downtime. Because I used to have the same kind of thing. Maybe it's not the exact same thoughts or the same words, but... I'll tell you what I did have, and I've shared this uh, with audiences before, and I noticed that there's a lot of nodding heads. So I think I'm not the only person who's dealt with this. I would literally, Christine, be sitting in my truck at a stoplight, and my mind would drift, and it would always drift back to this conversation or some conversation from 20 years ago when it didn't go well, I didn't do my part of it well. Um, and so for some reason, I'd be sitting in my truck, and I would be perfecting my side of the conversation from 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, trying to get it absolutely perfect and say something super pithy and like, I got exactly what I needed out of that, whatever. But so finally, one day I was sitting in my truck at the stoplight and realized that I was doing this. And I thought to myself, wow, this is like such a colossal waste of minutes of my life. And I asked myself the question, what would be better? Because I'd been doing this for a long time. And I came up with the idea that in those moments of downtime, I would use a mantra. And so it's not exactly an action step because I love the action steps, but I'll tell you what, it's a heck of a lot better than what I was doing. And so what I did is I said, well, I'm going to come up with five things that I want my life to be. And to use your suggestion, I did. I, I said them as if they were actually true. So for example, if it was, uh, you want to be an adventure traveler, you would say as your mantra, I am an adventure traveler. I see the world. And so my goal was that in my moments of downtime, I would go through each of my five ones five times. Well, that's a great plan, except when you have decades of old brain behavior. This is what it looked like in reality. I pull up to the stoplight, and I couldn't remember them, so I had to write them down in a card. So I have my little card in the front of the truck. I pull up to the stoplight. I look at the first one, Christine. I start saying it. Oh, my God. I'm like 10 seconds into it, and my mind is off in la la land, drifting back to this old... It took me about 90 days, but at the end of about 90 days, I got to the point where the minute I would have a moment of downtime my mind would default to my mantra. And this proved so unbelievably effective at bringing my life in the directions that I wanted to go that I then added it to my morning and my night routine. So the first thing I want to wake up in the morning, last thing before I go to bed, and any moment of downtime. Oh, I love that story. I love that. That is absolutely powerful. And isn't it, isn't it funny, our little brain, our little thoughts I I, um, I I forget where I heard it, but it, I just thought it was so brilliant because our thoughts are not us. Our thoughts are, you know, obviously they're things that come in and we can fixate on them and spiral into a world of despair or just trip up, trip up ourselves. Or uh, someone had told me once too, to think of thoughts as uh, if you're looking up into the sky, it's a beautiful, you know, sun filled day as a flock of birds. And <laughs> And the, they're, they're not always right there in front of your eyes. The flock of birds come into your peripheral, right? They come in and they uh, fly by and you can see them and then they go away. <laughs> yeah. And to think about how our thoughts, um, we can look at them like some birds flying by and, um, and then going out of our periphery, going out of our vision. Um, that's a way to also help, uh, help us with our thoughts. I just thought that, I wish I knew who that was because I would quote them. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Um, John, well, what, I have loved. The, oh, well, go ahead. I was just gonna say one of the wonderful things about this, though, is the way that you can use it to your advantage. This idea of connecting with your thoughts, and so in the writing process now, when I write a book, when it comes to me that it's time to write, I will literally say I will draw the line in the sand and I'd say I'm going to write, and then for two months or so, I will gather my thoughts and just capture them. And so much like the flock of birds you're talking about, I'll literally be sitting in the middle of doing something. All of a sudden, this great idea for a piece of the story comes to me. 
And so I think it's a question of how do I optimize the flocks so that I'm getting the ones that are most relevant to the life that I want to live and the contributions that I want to make. Oh, yes. Yeah. Let's focus on the good flock. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Right. John, it has been um, an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And I want to let our listeners know that they can um, get your book, The Cafe on the Edge of the World, a story about the meaning of life. I will have a link in the show notes and they can find it at all the places that you find books. And uh, for more information, uh, also, if you want to visit John's website, it's johnstralecki.com. That's johnstralecki.com. I'll have a link in the show notes as well to that. Check it out. Um, He's got so many amazing books too. uh, We were just talking a little bit about the cafe on the edge of the world, but uh, the big five for life, uh, what do we got? Uh, the Return to the Y Cafe, what I've learned, all these books. Um, John, just they keep pouring out of him. So do check out his website and, and get a hold of one of his books. You'll, you'll love it. And I want to thank you, wonderful listeners, for tuning in again. Uh, if you want more information about this podcast, you can go to outoftheboxwithchristine.com. And if you want more information about me or my coaching services, you can go to Christine Blasdale. Dot com. Remember, this show is on on air, online, and on demand at all your major podcast platforms, YouTube, and Pacifica Radio now. So thank you so much again for listening. And until next time, as I always say, remember to think outside that damn box. Bye for now.